Hello and welcome to What Makes a Medieval Knight, a Wallace Collection family live stream. My name is Ollie and I work at the Wallace Collection as a part of the learning team. Uh, but today I'm also joined by Millie Nice. Hello, I'm Millie Nice. I'm an illustrator and later on I'll be working with you to make some little medieval knights of our own. Can't wait to see those, uh, those little mini nights. That sounds really good fun. Um, but today we're also very lucky to be joined all the way from the Royal Armouries in Leeds by jouster extraordinaire, uh, Andy Dean. Hi there, indeed, Andy Dean. Uh, nearly 30 years of wearing medieval armour in one manner or another. So hopefully I'm the man to answer your questions about all things medieval and chivalrous. Definitely. We'll be uh, asking you a few questions about knights and armor and that sort of thing later in our Q&A section. So everybody make sure to get those questions in via the chat function. Uh, but just a few ground rules before we get started, as always. Uh, please make sure that you have a responsible adult with you at all times uh, whilst watching the stream. And it's the job of that responsible adult to uh, answer, ask any questions rather via the chat function. And of course the chat function is a public chat function. So please make sure to keep uh, all comments uh, appropriate for a family audience and make sure not to include any identifying information. Although we uh, are monitoring the chat uh, box, we're not responsible for the uh, comments made there. So with all of that business out of the way, let's take a wander around the Wallace Collection armories to see if we can find out what makes a medieval knight. Even 500 years after this magnificent armour would have been worn and used, medieval knights are still an important part of the world we live in and the stories we love. But what was it like to live life in the saddle? Was it all battles, banqueting and rescuing damsels? Who even were these knights? Where do they live? And what did they do when they weren't galloping around the countryside in shiny metal? This isn't much of a surprise as the armour itself is made in a particularly German style. We call it the Gothic style. They're like 500 year old Nikes, looking good. We know that the armor for the horse was made by Ulrich and it's almost complete, which is quite impressive as it's one of only three armours from this time for horses that's still in one piece. Isn't that right? The armour for the rider, however, has been pieced together using bits of armour from different sets, along with more modern parts. Who wants half an hour when you can have a whole one? Much more impressive. We don't actually know what state the armour was in when Pickett got hold of it.
Just take a look at this. But that didn't stop each country squabbling amongst themselves, which usually meant a bit of battle. But what were the dangers of a late medieval battlefield? Well, let's find out. You could even say that by this point in time, get it, point in time, swords weren't even really the best weapon to use if you were fighting somebody dressed head to toe in armour. That's not why it's called a pollax though. It's called that because an old word for head was pole. So this is a head axe. On horseback, which is where a knight really likes to be, the lance was the weapon of choice. It might seem like a pretty basic piece of kit, but with the help of a warhorse that could gallop up to 40 miles an hour, the lance could really pack a punch. Armour wasn't just made to stop you from being chopped into pieces, it was also a great way to tell everyone that not only were you very rich, but an important person too. This was called the feudal system, and it decided who was in charge of what. That doesn't mean they always wore their armour though. For example, special laws were brought in to stop wealthy people, who weren't knights or nobles, from wearing certain kinds of fabrics.
However, by the end of the 1400s and the beginning of the 1500s, certain people who weren't knights or nobles were really starting to bend some of these rules. Well, we hope this has given you a good idea about what life was really like for a medieval knight and how armour can even take on a bit of a life of its own. If you do have any other questions, just send them in via the chat function and we'll try to get back to you before the end of the stream. Well, welcome back everybody to What Makes a Medieval Knight, a Wallace Collection family live stream. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed our little trip around the uh, the galleries there to look at some of our, our favorite armors. I'm of course, of course joined again by Andy Dean Jouster, who will uh, be answering some of our questions a little later on today. Uh, but before we get started with that, uh, Millie, nice, great to have you back. I believe you've got some uh, some night based crafts for us this afternoon or this I morning rather. I do, yeah. That was great fun. I hope your head's okay, Molly. Just about, <laughs> yeah. That that polax a real number, even with a helmet. It's uh, yeah, quite a piece that one. But I'm I survived just about. I think. Good, good. So today I thought we should make some armor of our own. I was really inspired by those little knights, so I'm going to show you my desk um, and we're going to take a look at how to do it. Now, I especially like this one here, Ollie. You spent a lot of time with this guy. Um, I spent a lot of time with this guy too and I thought he was just fantastic. He's on his horse, he's looking good and I really, really liked these decorations. Definitely. These sort of zigzags he has. Um, I thought we could have a go making our own. Now this kind of decoration, am I right in calling it embossing? Yeah, definitely. So when you see, um, you know, metal that's been sort of hammered or the surface of the metal has been hammered into certain shapes, um, that's, yeah, that's embossing. And it's, it's a kind of decoration that appears on all different kinds of armor. Uh, it's also on, you know, silver objects at the Wallace Collection and other bits and pieces. Uh, but you definitely see a lot of it in the armory. And for the Gothic armor, it's quite sort of reserved, but it still gives a, a great uh, sort of style choice, really. It looks really cool. Yeah, fantastic. Well, today we can be reserved or we can be out there. It's up to you. This is our armor that we're designing. No hammers today, but what you are going to need is one of the sheets, one of the downloadable sheets, which are on the same page that you found the link to get here. If you don't have a printer, don't worry, you can just copy it. Um, you're also gonna need a little bit of foil. I'm using a yogurt lid, free of yogurt. Um, you are gonna need a piece of card, a glue stick, a pair of scissors, and a good ordinary ballpoint pen. And what we're gonna do, is to start with, I'm going to make a helmet today because I've already made most of my armor. So I'm just finishing up the helmet. We're going to start by taking our card and our foil and we're going to stick our foil to our card. Now I spent a little while flattening out this foil. You know, that thing you do after you've finished your yogurt. Take some time to really flatten it out. So spend some time doing that so it's nice and flat. We can stick it to our card. This makes it just that little bit stronger because it does need to be strong if it's going to protect our little knight. You are then going to take your template or your copy drawing of your template. I'm just doing a helmet and just pop it on top. I'm using a little bit of tape to hold it in place to make sure it doesn't wobble about. Now for the embossing. Now for this embossing where Hundreds of years ago, we might have used hammers. We are using a ballpoint pen and we are going to use our ballpoint pen to press quite hard and go firstly all around the edge of this helmet, marking out our shape. And then once we've gone all around the edge, we can start to add some decoration. Ollie, I've been wondering, do you know What's this little point on the top for? No, I don't know. In fact, um, I it would imagine. You look cool. I think so. Yeah, as as with a lot of armor, although it's very important for it to, of course, be practical and keep the wearer safe. Um, a lot of it is about how good you look and and creating that sort of 
image of uh, of someone dressed in armor to impress other people. Uh, you know, as we were saying in the video there, you've got to make sure everybody knows who you are and what you do. So uh, yeah, I think it's probably just a, a kind of bit of style. Fantastic. Right, so I've gone around the edge and I've just started adding my decoration. Now the nice bit about this is you can draw it on the top of your template so you can see the lines you're drawing, but they, we're going to look at them in a minute, will magically appear on your armour underneath. Now, I'm using a few different pieces. I've sort of been recycling all my different foils. But after watching what you said, that seems quite appropriate because people did use lots of different foils, didn't they? Or lots of different bits of armour when they're putting these pieces together in museums. Yeah, definitely. Uh, most of our armors, uh, or not most of our armors necessarily, but most armors that you see in museums are what we call composites. So they're, you know, thrown together by different uh, collectors or maybe one collector and different bits of armor from from all over. And I'm sure uh, Andy will be able to tell us a little more about uh, the armors at the uh, Royal Armories as well and how that sort of affects us a little later on during our Q and A. Fantastic! It's reveal time, guys. Let's have a look. Yeah, take off this one, and here we have it. Our little embossed armor. So next up, you're gonna take your scissors and you're gonna carefully cut this out. And if you have a helpful adult around, you're gonna grab them and get you to give them a hand with this little bit. Um, it is foil, which is still metal, though a little bit less dangerous than the kind they might've been dealing with a long time ago. Please be careful. Wouldn't want any accidental damage, although I'm sure there was plenty of accidental damage when people were making their armor. We're gonna go carefully around this edge to make our helmet. Now, you can make a whole suit of armor with your templates. And once you've finished, there are a few different things we can do with them. I've got one I finished up earlier here. And I'm going to stick that helmet on the top. I gave him a sort of zigzag decoration. I can see why those gothic armourers stuck to their simple decoration with embossing. It's a little bit easier and it gives this really cool sort of super, I think it's, it's pretty, you know, pretty impressive effect, these Definitely. little emboss lines. But if you're feeling like more of a challenge, then I challenge you to take a little bit of string to find all those little dots that I put on the template and make yourself a little dancing armor puppet just by tying some string in between those dots. I was quite a fan of him. He's been keeping me company all week. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely a great companion for lockdown and a great little gothic armor there as well. That's fantastic. Well, I hope everyone has a, a bit of fun making those along at home. Um, but now it's time to get your questions in uh, because we are joined, of course, by Andy Dean, uh, armorer from the, uh, the Royal Armories up in Leeds. And uh, let's get you up there, Andy, uh, to spotlight the video. Just a moment. There we are. Ah, thank you. That's no problem. Um, so, Andy, just tell us a little bit about what you do for the Royal Armouries. Uh, right. So, the Royal Armouries up in Leeds was uh, opened by Her Majesty in 1996. And as part of the museum, there's an outdoor arena area. That arena area became known as the Tilt Yard, which is classically where knights in the 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th century would. Uh, have a lot of fun playing in armor with big sticks and uh, mm. and uh, and doing a lot of showing off. <laughs> Definitely. So uh, obviously, kind of hard to do a bit of showing off at the moment with everything uh, locked down. But I see you've got your armor there behind you. So uh, have you been, uh, you know, kitting up while well in lockdown? Or now and again, this is my retired armor. You see, <laughs> the thing about uh, age is it's more difficult to keep the weight off. And armors are designed very, very, they're like an exoskeleton. So <laughs> if I've had too many pies or Christmas comes too quickly, uh, 
I had to get a bigger armor. So this is one of my original armors. And uh, yeah, so I, I'm in a very luxurious position at the museum. It, they get me to wear lots of different armors from lots of different periods. So obviously the medieval period is the most glamorous uh, and like uh, a bee to honey, that's where I was drawn. Oh, fantastic. So that's that's your kind of favorite area, is it? I think so. Certainly, when it comes to riding and uh, and pushing the boundaries of what uh, what uh, you can do as far as competition is concerned, while wearing armor, jousting is uh, is the very pinnacle. I think. Fantastic. Well, I've got a few questions here that have come through uh, via the chat function. Um, uh -huh. So, first of all, we have one coming in here that says, uh, "Were mounted knights still technically important on the battlefield?" Uh, when this armour, the, the question armour that we've been looking at, uh, so around 1480, I suppose it'd be, so about 500 years ago, I think what they're asking is, were knights still important on the battlefield at that time? Absolutely. There was a critical moment in the Battle of uh, Bosworth between uh, Henry Tudor and uh, Richard III, and the climactic moment was a, a charge into Henry Tudor's armour, led by uh, Richard III with his lance, and then once he'd lost his lance, his sword came out, when the sword got grabbed, he took a meso, uh, and the armour made him almost impervious, until such time as a load of people grabbed him, pulled him off his horse, and then things went a bit uh, wrong. A bit pear shaped anyway. after that. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> uh, Armour is, is a, a superb piece of equipment for staying alive on the battlefield or staying safe in the tournament field. It, obviously, it evolved over hundreds of years. And as the understanding of metal got better and how to turn it and move it and uh, sort of caress it around the body, armors became a sensational way of staying alive. Fantastic. You know, that actually uh, feeds in quite nicely to my next question that we have coming in here we, from, uh, from Leo S. Uh, did the armour change and get better as weapons became stronger? So I think you've touched on that a little there, that people got a bit better at making armour, maybe. All of that, really. And although it's sort of st still seen as a, a black art, their understanding from uh, craftsman to apprentice was passed on and the apprentice improved on things. And as they understood uh, metology, for want of a better word, they knew that uh, this stuff called carbon, if you got it right, would make your armour still springy keep it relatively light. And because you uh, hammered lots of plates that slide over each other and are leathered and riveted together, it basically means it moves when you do. So by the middle of the sort of 1400s, they got it pretty much spot on. And then they played with it and played with it throughout the 1500s and probably came to an end in this country with the uh, with the death of Elizabeth I. I would have said that's the death of the, the beautiful armors, although armors continued almost to the 20th century, really, in one way or another. Sure, I suppose you still see people wearing, you know, uh, uh, firefighters wearing helmets and that sort of thing today. I suppose just different different uses. Yeah, I mean, even in the Second World War, tank crews used to have mail across the front of their helmets to stop the shrapnel coming in and such like. So mail and plate were still had uh, uh, links from the, uh, the 20th century all the way back. And, and mail, just to be clear, that's the little circles of metal. Thousands of interlinking rings all riveted together. It's uh, it's like um, it's it feels like metal, but moves like a blanket. And so you can make uh, the material to go underneath the armpits, inside the arms, all the places where the solid stuff, the plate, can't go. Stick mail, generally. Always a good idea to have mail. <laughs> We've got some questions here. This is about knights, but not necessarily about armor. Uh, we have a question: Did knights wear capes? Do you know if there's any evidence of wearing capes at all, like superheroes? <laughs> it's a bit like uh, uh, The Incredibles. Villains and, and heroes <laughs> shouldn't really wear capes. <laughs> They're all the pain. Certainly for uh, if I was entering into a grand tournament, then I would wear a, a cape covered in ermine and velvet and such like. But when the fighting started, get rid of your cape. That's a good idea. I think, yeah, no capes is uh, the, the rule of thumb, I think. <laughs> no capes! <laughs> we have a question here from John, age five. He says, uh, did it hurt when a knight got poked in the heart? I think it might mean when maybe he got hit with a, a, a pole axe or something like that. Um, well, yeah, going back to sort of personal uh, experience, obviously <laughs> we kind of enact foot combats and jousts and such like, and some of it can be quite um, heated. Uh, and so... <laughs> Getting the 
the worst thing to happen is really someone to wrap a polax around your head. As your little, uh, your, your film said, being concussed is the worst thing. You're fairly impervious to almost everything else. But once you're concussed, your brain sort of spins inside your skull several times. You get disorientated, you fall over. And that's when the people come with their pointy sticks or pointy things and they start pointing you where the armor is. So uh, thankfully, usually the heart's usually protected somewhere or another. Even if you're lower down, people found something to protect themselves, thick linen or, or leather or, or even uh, horn in some uh, cases, armor obviously is the the vital thing no matter what you're doing if you're going into conflict good thinking so you're nice nice and covered on the chest there you're not going to get any uh polexes <laughs> yeah exactly the most important thing is the computer so get yourself a helmet uh, and the engine so uh, get yourself something to protect the, uh, the the body these bits you could probably sort of live without for a bit but this you can't and this you can't so though that, that was Top of your thoughts when, when choosing armour. Vital part of it then. Uh, we have another question coming here from Max. Uh, would a king have dressed as a knight to go into battle? And if so, uh, would he have had special armour to identify him? So I think what they're asking there is, would a king also wear armour? And would it have been different in any way to that of a knight, for example? Well, the embossing that we saw earlier would basically uh, stand you out in the middle of the battlefield. And the whole thing about... Uh, colour on the battlefield and flags and uh, and comparisons wrapping your horse is that you needed to be identified either by your your friends or by your enemy because your enemy uh the high up in the in the echelons of society you basically fought each other so fighting a peasant wasn't much fun but fighting the uh, the earl of suffolk now that was fun <laughs> and generally you were likely to be pulled from your horse and ransomed back to the family than you were to be sort of step, 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 step stuff. So saying I'm really important and I'm worth a lot of money is a good way of probably saving yourself on the battlefield. As for kings leading battle, well, I mentioned Richard III, Henry V famously. Now, he didn't ride into battle. English knights tended to, to walk into the battle. It was, a, it was very much a European thing, riding into battle. Uh, <laughs> and we basically stayed with our yeomen. Um, but nonetheless, identification on the battlefield was incredibly important and being the leader of men meant you led from the front and that really didn't change until i mean henry the eighth tried it also and obviously elizabeth the first couldn't really lead uh, from the front as far as wearing armor and charging on, on a steed she led in many other ways and she led for a long time um, but after elizabeth the first then you find kings on the battlefield but they stand a little bit to the back Seems quite sensible, bit bit safer back there. We're, <laughs> we're just at 9.30, so we're just coming to the end of our stream now, but we do have one last question I wanted to uh, to pass on from our comments section there. And, and it was just somebody asking, um, what was the relative cost of armour over time? So, you know, was armour always very expensive? Did it get become more expensive as time went on? You spoke a little bit about um, the sort of armour around the time of Elizabeth I, for example. Yeah, so, about the period we were sort of talking about, the late medieval, uh, early Tudor, uh, going to a tournament was like going to see the Olympics and Formula One all put in together. So colourful, so prestigious. Um, and so, what was the question? Oh, just that, how much, how much did armour cost? Was it very expensive okay. over time? Yeah. Imagine buying a Formula One car <laughs> and then getting the entire team to look after it and look after you. That's kind of where you're, where you're at in modern uh, terms. So not cheap, definitely. Well, thank you. Not so cheap. <laughs> thank you so much, Andy, for joining us today. And uh, I definitely give that armour a bit of a polish after all this, I'm sure. Um, and thank you for answering all of those questions. And thank you, of course, to everyone at home for, for sending those questions in. Uh, thanks also to Millie for that uh, fantastic demo of, uh, of our little knight in shining armour. Um, I think, you know, that certainly would have been a very expensive armour at the time, the one, that, the one that you've created today for your dancing knight. Uh, so thanks for, thanks for that today. <laughs> 
And of course, just one final thank you for everyone who's joined along at home and uh, has hopefully been creating their own little embossed uh, uh, armor, uh, suits of armor. Um, so yeah, thank you for joining. And of course, we will be having another stream coming up uh, next in the Easter holidays. Um, so keep an eye out on our website and on our YouTube channel uh, for the links to that. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, stay safe, of course, and have a good half term and see you soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.